Hello, I'm Katrina Moran, the Head of School at Sagan South International School. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the ninth annual VTC, the Vietnam Tech Conference. For the last nine years, SSIS has collaborated with UNIS Hanoi, the United Nations International School, to present this conference. And our goal in bringing this group of esteemed colleagues together is to push the boundaries on educational technology, to foster global citizenship, and to provide a venue where we can collaborate and share on best practices in integrating technology in our classrooms. As the only Apple Distinguished School in Vietnam, SSIS is recognized as a leader in the field and a leader in innovation and the integration of technology in teaching and learning. We are dedicated to provide the best possible programs to our students and our efforts are greatly supported by our innovative tech coaches who support teachers in integrating technology in their classrooms. However, in this world of constant and rapid change, it behooves us all as educators to understand how the technology we use supports student learning, adds value to their lives and enhances our lesson plans. And there is no one better suited in supporting us in our endeavors than our keynote speaker today, Craig Kemp. Craig is an enthusiastic change agent, a global educational consultant and podcaster. He has inspired sustainable and long-lasting technology implementation and transformation and positive change in schools across the world. So please join me in extending a very warm virtual welcome to Craig as he shares his insights in today's keynote presentation, The Changing Face of Education, Human versus Technology. Thank you for joining us today and thank you, Craig, for sharing your insights. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough no more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation well the list goes on science fiction is becoming science fact think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think the way we work will never be the same the skills we need will be dramatically different winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before so what's your response how will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history are you driving change or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion, and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, You've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. 
The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, relate, and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen. The future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. I often get asked, will machines and AI replace teachers? And my answer is always no. Yes, they'll help us do some of our tasks. But as we just saw in the video, machines are good at doing, but not at being. As educators, we need to focus on the human-only traits like creativity, imagination, intuition, and emotion. COVID has given us this chance to create the new normal. During this conference, I challenge you to keep an open mindset and think about how you can push those boundaries. How can you engage? How can you do better? How can you create that new normal? Now, after this introduction, let me tell you a little bit about this Kiwi guy sitting behind the camera here at the bottom of your screen, talking to you today as the keynote presenter. You know, I'm originally from New Zealand. I hope you can understand my accent. It's pretty thick and I often have to slow things down for people to understand, but I'm gonna do my best uh, to get through this. And if you need subtitles, you might have to do that. Uh, I moved to Singapore nine years ago and as a Kiwi in a public school system, a primary school trained teacher, moving to the big world, big city life in Asia of Singapore uh, with my wife. And it was scary, you know, coming from a small public school like many of you have before in your careers. You know, I love technology and, and I helped my school grow a one-to-one -one device program. I, I grew up through my school as a teacher to a deputy teaching deputy principal. And I moved over here to an Australian curriculum school as a teacher in a primary school setting, but also in a position trying to help grow and develop the middle school. And at the same time, give them advice and support on how to use technology authentically and purposefully. And over the four years, not only did we build out a pretty successful, small scale middle school, but we also built out what I think is a pretty solid strategy behind why technology could be a part of that school setting. So after that, those first few years, I moved to a large international school, Stanford American here in Singapore, 3,200 students, uh, 400 plus teachers. And my role was director of technology and innovation. And uh, the bigger picture of my role was to support the authentic and purposeful use of technology and innovation by our teachers in the classroom. And we had to change and improve our model along the way. And I'll talk about that as a case study a little bit later on, because it's a really important piece of the puzzle when we talk about why technology, why now, and why me? You know, it's a huge piece of that puzzle. And another big piece of what we do is why we do it. And I always love to start my talks around my family because as you can see, this is my family and they're amazing, they're beautiful, they're gorgeous, they're funny, uh, they give me everything I need to do what I do and they really do drive my why. And I think it's really important for us to understand the difference between your school why, your personal why and how those two do come together because as teachers we're really poor at figuring out that work-life balance. And what I want to show you here is that, you know, that work-life balance can happen. It can be a reality. I made the decision to leave my school for my family. My business came from that. And the consultancy work I do today, working with schools and ed tech companies, uh, has been a culmination of my experience, but what my family brings to it as well. I challenge you to, and ask you what your why is. As you're sitting there with your, you know, in there in Vietnam or you're somewhere else around the world watching this live with me today as I sit here in my house in Singapore, I challenge you, what's your why? What's this personal why? What's your professional why? And we'll delve into that a little bit more now as well. 
But before we do that, I want to talk about the current state of EdTech. In the work that I do, I work with schools and organizations from all over the world. And in particular, over the last 12 months, I've worked with schools and helping them develop their strategy, their thought processes, and their integrations of technology during these challenging times. We're still in those challenging times now. Some of you here today listening live are still in remote teaching situations. Some of you, you know, teachers here in Singapore, you're in the classroom working with kids on a daily basis. My kids right now, you know, they've been at school this week and they've, they've, they've been there. And that's great. It's still not the normal we expect it to be, what it was like before then. But we're in this position where we can create this new normal. And these are the things that I've noticed over the past 12 months, thanks to COVID-19 and what has happened. You know, we've not just adapted to change, but we've been thrown in the deep end of the pool. Most schools, most of you sitting here today, had no strategy plan in place for what would happen in case of a pandemic. And here in Asia, we were one of the first affected by that. Singapore, we had cases almost immediately because COVID hit around Chinese New Year and people were traveling and it, it caused this massive sweep of the virus across our countries. And we had nothing in plan. We were forced into this remote learning, which of course, teachers, it set us into high levels of stress and panic. Parents didn't know what to do because all of a sudden they were working from home and having to manage their kids as a teacher, you know, as a mentor, as a guide to learning. But they had positive impacts too. It helped our parents understand just how hard we work as teachers every day. You know, they know now that it's not just a nine to three job. We have these cushy jobs that allow us to be on holiday all the time. I always used to tell my friends that asked me that, yeah, it's a great job. Go and do your four or five years of study and then come and join me doing it. It's super rewarding. You know, always take the positive stance rather than the negative stance. Be optimistic rather than pessimistic. These mindsets are changing and we have this unique opportunity, although budgets are dropping, priorities have adapted to mean that technology now is one of the most important pieces of our school's infrastructure. Parents see this as a portal that will help them be more efficient and effective in what they can do in a remote learning scenario, but also that communication between home and school and how we can improve that. One of the things I love is that PD options are growing. You're sitting wherever you are around the world right now listening to this. I'm sitting in my house in Singapore being able to deliver you a keynote the same way that I would in person. You know, I love the face-to-face -face connections and I can't wait for that to come back, but we're still able to do the things we do from our home or from our device. And it's about being creative with that. How can you be creative with these solutions in your school? The COVID situation has brought us a few different scenarios. It's, it's given us the opportunity to use tools for free. EdTech companies have said, here you go, use them. Uh, they're all yours, but at the end, you're going to have to pay for them. What that, that has caused for us is a, a massive overload with EdTech in our schools. And we've had to say, no, 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 stop. Too much. We can't do any more. We need to be strategic. And a lot of schools haven't got to this point yet. And right now, in my Ignite EdTech consultancy company, we're doing a lot of work with schools like yours, supporting them and going, hold on, stop. Let's go back a step. Let's talk about what went well, what didn't go so well. And then more importantly, what strategy can we put in place to be successful now, but more importantly, in the short, mid and long term future as well. And that means let's look at the EdTech tools we're using, what works for teachers, and how can we align our budget to support those needs? How can we find the tools that can help us do things all in one spot? And my final point here is something that I'm pretty passionate about. And I'll, I'll give you an example in a moment about Singapore, and that's the inequitable access to devices. You know, I, I know uh, I live in a country that's extremely lucky. You know, there's a lot of money and wealth here. Uh, there's a lot of support from the government. People follow the rules and do the right thing. You're potentially in a country not quite like that. In the work that I do, I work with people all over the world, and I've seen a lot of inequitable access to device issues, not just devices, but resources. And Singapore actually found that out the hard way. In March, they went through this lockdown. 
Um, they said to teachers, you know, you got to do your best, teach from home, uh, get our kids on devices. And what they found actually was they had the seven-year rollout plan to the end of 2027. By the end of 2027, all secondary school pupils would have a device. And immediately they found out that there were kids missing out on, you know, proper and good authentic learning opportunities because they weren't connected. They didn't have devices. They didn't have the right setup to be able to support them. So immediately, and this is what I love about the government here, they stepped into action and they said seven years is not good enough. Let's realign our budget. Let's realign our priorities. And the Minister of Education came out and said, our priority is to give every student equal learning opportunities. Every teacher the opportunity to empower those learners in the same way. And they put out this tender and they've said by the end of 2021, every student in Singapore secondary schools will have a device. An amazing way of helping, helping move from that inequitable access to actually making it happen and actioning it. A priority where education is number one. And I hope that more governments and state systems globally are going to do that. And I've been in discussions with systems all over the world, ministries of education, trying to move towards doing that. And it's exciting to see that movement. Now, I wanted to show you this graphic because it shows the mindsets of schools. And this came actually in March, right on when COVID hit. So we're a wee way down the track now, but it shows you the response that people had, schools had, in adopting technology in their schools. You know, you see here the red line showing a decrease or a negative view on taking on technology. You know, you look at Oceania, and for me, being from New Zealand, it's a bit disappointing to see the approach that schools took, you know. Let's give you packets. Let's give you learning to take home. But we haven't thought about or planned for how technology could add value. And there's been a shift in that now. And I think if we saw that graphic updated to today, there would be a, a, a magnificent shift. You know, Middle East, what an amazing positive response. 80% of schools said, yes, we're going to increase the use of technology to enhance our teaching and learning process. Asia, you know, pretty split, 50-50 split. What I like to see is, is maybe now, how has this changed? How does this reflect the school that you're working in? And how can we move this going forward? Over my time working in these schools, I saw three types of teachers. Number one, those teachers that thrived. They took it on. They, they imagined things. They were innovative. They tried new things. Number two, those teachers that hung on. They were like, we'll do this, but only because we have to. We survived. And that probably makes up 80% of us. 80% of us were in a scenario where really we, we had no choice but to, to hang in there and survive. And unfortunately, we had the small percentage of teachers that just gave up. They said, right, I'm done. No more. I'm at the end of my teaching career. I've got no time to learn something new. I've done uh, everything I can for my time here. Also, though, beginning teachers who didn't have that support network, people that have been in teaching but didn't have people to bounce off. That mental health and well-being really uh, took its toll on a lot of people. And, you know, for the good and bad of schools, we lost teachers. You know, we lost students. Uh, but we're on the other side now. You know, we see that we're getting to a point where hopefully in the coming 12, 24 months, we're going to be able to create that new normal. We're going to be able to move from surviving to thriving. But how do we do that? We don't do that by this attitude. You know, these are the teachers that used to say, and they still do probably today, and not just in ed tech, but in everything you do. And, you know, when I'm doing this face to face, I often say to teachers, it's a bit awkward, don't look around and catch eye with that teacher you're thinking of. But, you know, in this virtual scenario, we can think about that teacher right now. And we could message our colleagues that are listening and saying, you know, that's Jenny or that's John down the road. But it's those teachers that say, this is the way we've always done things. It is no longer acceptable to say we cannot use technology. I, you know, I get, I'm successful in what I do right now with my paper and pen scenario. Yes, you're successful, but is this relevant for the learners in your classroom, for the learners in your school? And we look at the diffusion of innovation model and we, and we look in the middle here. Majority of us sit in the middle. Most of us are the early and late majority. Most of us 
are that teacher next door model is what I like to call it. You know, I like to do things, but I only do it once the teacher next door does it first. I only do it when I see other people being successful and I know I'm not going to fail. But we have those people, the innovators, the ones that take risks and try new things. Probably you, I'm preaching to the converted here because you're the ones that do these things. Your challenge is how do you take this back to your school and influence others to do the same things? How do you bring on those early adopters and change the mindsets of teachers? I tell you how you do it. You do it by focusing no energy and time at the beginning on the laggards because you'll give them 10% of your time and they'll zap 90% of your energy. It's not worth it. Trust me, I've been there. Focus on the people that want to change immediately. You'll get to the laggards. They will come on board. You will have to invest time in them eventually, but wait until you've got the majority on board first. They need to see that you've got that change. They need to see that it's valuable for them and what they do so that they can move forward. You know, one of the things that I think of uh, when I think of the process that we can do when we're starting to move people from being early adopters into being, uh, sorry, being laggards and the late majority to being those early adopters and innovators, I think about how do we change mindsets? And I like to put it into this sort of scenario, is that if we want to get results, if we want to move people, whatever those results are, you know, fill in the blank for your school. It could be to engage learners with technology. It could be to create and, uh, and, and make assessments that actually inform teaching and learning. But the way I see it is the first step is to create that culture, create that strategy and build that team. Create a team of innovators and early adopters that can build a plan. But it's not done by you, the tech people, it's done by everyone, by a teacher. You need that teacher next door, you need that struggling teacher to help you in developing the right plan. Most importantly, as we talked about at the beginning, it's people over technology. Technology should always come second. I've been in schools where, and you might be in schools now, where technology is always dumped on your desk and you're expected to do something with it. It doesn't work. Do it right. People first, learning first, technology second. So lead professional learning and build capacity in people before you expect them to actually implement and use it. Share, you know, reward growth. Set up ways of sharing because we want to focus on that 60 to 70% people, percent of people that want to change and grow. Bring them on board. Optional PD, compulsory PD, non-negotiables. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then jump into classrooms, teach, let teachers teach each other so that we can actually move forward and be successful. Because often in schools, when you hear the word technology, you probably think of this or this, you know, maybe even this. But the reality is that we actually forget about the best piece of technology ever invented. It's not a device. It's not a tablet, it's not a smartphone or a smart watch. It's a pencil and a piece of paper. It's still technology and it's still a valuable resource. You know, I've, as a tech director and a coach, I've seen some of the best lessons I've ever taught by the most tech savvy educators being taught with pencil and paper. We don't have to use technology all the time and that's the thing that often scares people away. You know, tech is important, but it's not always the answer. It's not the thing that has to be a priority. We can use tech, but when we think about tech, we should think about models like the SAMA model, for example. Ways of bringing people into a scenario, because often this tech overload is what causes people that stress, the ability to think before they act. And unfortunately, in our schools, we've had this really terrible strategic development, which has led to poor implementation, you know, and, and schools have gone more and more and more, let's use more. But it actually leads to more work, which leads to more stress, which leads to teachers being unwell, students being unwell, and that constant cycle of negativity when it comes to well-being. You know, these free tech offerings, they're great. You know, I've jumped on many of them. But the reality is that it has to be context specific. 
I can share as many tools as I want with you that I love and I think are great, and I'm going to share a couple later. But it's not because I expect you to go away and do them. It's because it's a case study for me. It's something that's been successful, and maybe some of you will love that because it's your specific context that's important. Your school is unique. You're unique. We need to reduce that stress by being more strategic about choosing the right tools for the right purpose and thinking about that why. So, what does that look like for your school? You know, it means create a strategic plan that includes educational technology. It means building a culture first and strategy second. You know, I love the saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it's so true. Focus on building that belief, the trust, the culture that technology is going to help them before you implement a strategy. And ask them, talk to them, what worked, what didn't, what can you do to help them. Focus on that building capacity, professional learning, and identify those problem areas and find solutions to solve those. Ask ed tech companies to help you solve those problems. Tech companies should not be knocking on your door and selling you a product. That was my biggest frustration as an ed tech director. They should be coming to you and saying, what's your problem? They should be able to say to you, this is how my tool can solve your problems. Get them answering your questions. Let you be the one telling them what you need and aligning the solution to meet those needs. And most importantly, know your why as an individual and as a school. But let's look at some data now because how are you actually going to move forward and adapt and change? And I always like to share this one. This is a, a, my Kiwi accent sometimes gets me into trouble here, so bear with me, but this is a floppy disk. And I like to go into my students' classes often and drop this on the table in front of them and say, what is it? And I've got a really cool uh, story from when I was working with some schools a few years ago in Australia, and I did this. And I threw these floppy disks on the table in front of the kids. And the first thing, they didn't know me, and I said to them, what do you think this is? What could this be? And immediately, this one girl threw up her hand. She's like, sir, sir, sir. And I was like, just wait. Let's let everyone have a discussion. The teacher's on the side laughing, rolling her eyes. You know, it's always the kid that thinks they know best. And I give them a little bit of time. And then I ask a few few children. And they say, yep, we know. We know exactly what it is. So I go back to this girl and I say, what are these? I hold them up. She goes, it's so easy, sir. It's a 3D printed version of the save icon. And I'm sitting there laughing. The teachers are laughing. And she's adamant. And the other kids are like, yep, yep, that's it. And they're adamant that these are 3D printed things that I've just brought into their school because it looks like the save icon in their device and what they use every day. They have no idea of the technology that has come before them. So I hold it up and I say to them, you know, this device, this is what we use to play games. This is what we use to save our documents. And I hold it up and I say, this has an amazing 1.44 megabytes of data on it. And they look at me and they have no idea what this means. And I say to them, you know, my iPhone, right now, I take one photo on that iPhone and it can't fit on this disc. This disc doesn't even hold a photo, one photo from my phone. Yet I can get a thumb drive the size of my fingernail or a Google Drive or a OneDrive, and I can hold thousands of feature films. I can fe put thousands of videos, movies, photos, documents, and I don't even think about it. So it's important for our kids to understand that, but it's important for us to understand where our kids are coming from as well, that we're not teaching for our past, we're teaching for their future. And we focus on this, creation over consumption, because every learner is a creator. And we're the only ones that can design those conditions for that creation. And Seymour Papa says it well. He says the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. And I want you to think about what you teach, what your colleagues teach, and how you do that. And whether you are a provider of creation opportunities for your learners or are you a provider of ready-made knowledge something to keep in the back of your mind. 
And as we think about that, I want to share one of my favorite pieces of research, and it comes from the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report. And in their Future of Jobs report, and they release this every year or two, and this is the most recent that came out in December of 2020. And when they released this, uh, they shared it in a 400-page document. I've taken a small portion of that to share with you here. But these are, the, based on their huge amount of research, these are the 10 skills that our learners will need in 2025. When you look at this, 50% are problem-solving skills. Analytical thinking, complex problem-solving, critical thinking, creativity, initiative, originality, reasoning and problem-solving and ideation. 50%. It's a huge amount. Do you explicitly teach these skills? Are you explicitly helping your learners grow and develop to a point where they need to be doing these to be successful in the world that they're going to live in in the future? If the answer is no, I challenge you to go away after this and think about how can you change? How can you adapt to meet these skills? How can these skills influence your why, your curriculum, your teaching and learning experiences? And then how can these skills influence even in the next day how can these skills influence the programs, the courses, the, the workshops that you attend? Because I want you to think about these. I want these to be part of your why, to help drive that change and move us forward. So what does the research tell us? You know, the UNICEF screen time data shows us, and this is from 2018, and I'm happy to share the link for those that are interested as well that children under 18 represent one in three internet users. And this piece is one that I love because as a tech director, I constantly got parents coming to me, coming and saying, you know, screen time this, screen time that, I can't get my child off their device. And I'm going to show you a few other pieces of data that you can throw at them soon as well. But the focus is always and should always be not how much time you spend on the device, but what they're doing. Can you manage and control that? Can you help them move and grow forward? Because this is what happens in an internet minute. And if you love data, search, this is what happens in an internet minute and look back over the last 10 years and how this data has changed. And of course, ignore Tinder on here for this scenario. But when we look at these things, we look at these tools like Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, you know, TikTok. Are we including these things in our teaching and learning programs? I still work with schools, and I just earlier this week worked with a school, an international school, that still blocks YouTube. Why in this day and age are we blocking a resource that our kids go to most out of anything else? Why are we stopping them? I would rather them make a mistake in my school than at their home behind a locked door. If that's the rationale, then there's nothing that can back that up. I challenge you to challenge the decision makers in your school to make sure that we can use these tools to engage our learning learners in meaningful and authentic ways. This is another one of my favorite research studies that comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics and something to use with your parents and part of your training program is quality versus quantity. And their research over and over again shows that under 18 months is the only age range where it can be detrimental to physical health well-being, uh, eyesight, hearing, those sorts of things. From the age of two to five, they say no more than one hour a day. So we really shouldn't be putting devices in our kids' hands at an early age in our schools unless it is to be creating. And from the age of six and up, it's up to the parents' discretion. They know their kids better than we do. And this research study that came from the University of Oxford, uh, studying 300,000 adolescents in the US and the UK, they found out that 0.4% of well-being, just 0.4%, can be attributed to the use of technology. That data shows them that screen time is no more harmful to teenage mental health than eating potatoes. It is ridiculous. And there's all sorts of research coming out that backs this up. And I encourage you to go away and take this out. Look up the University of Oxford study and pull it apart. And see how that can help people in your school, but, but parents as well and leaders better understand why we do what we do. Because as Simon Sinek says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Everything we do should be justified. If you can't justify the use of technology in your classroom, don't use it. It's as simple as that. 
And he has a book called Start With The Why and several others that I'm sure some of you and most of you have probably seen and know about. But if you haven't, go away and look it up. He says that the epicenter of everything we do, and not just in schools, but in business and in our personal lives, we should start with the why. Can we justify why we need to do this? Why do we need this tool? Why do we need this bit of software? Then we can move to the how. How are we going to implement it? How is it going to impact learning? Then we can get to the learning experience. What do we do? What does it look like? And another important piece of pedagogy here, and something that I hope that you have the opportunity to explore over this conference as well, is the SAMA model. And I'll also reference here the TPAC model, which I love, but as a basic model to share to you and something for you to take away, I like the SAMA model, a framework that helps us understand how and why we integrate technology. It's not a template. It's not something you can put in your planning document and go, right, I need an S, an A, an M, and an R. It doesn't work that way. Ruben Putendera, the guy that created this model, has done years and years of research, and he always says, and I've been lucky enough to see him several times in person and online, that it's not a ladder. You don't work yourself up the SAMA model. You find ways to be transformative. When you're using technology, you ask yourself, is this modifying or redefining learning, or is it just substituting? Sometimes, and for some of our teachers, substitution is a massive win. Substitution might be, you know, I had a science textbook and now it's an ebook. For some people, that's a big win. It might be, I used to get my kids to take note in a notebook, now I get them to use a, a notebook on their device. You know, they're using OneNote or they're using Google Docs. That starts us in this augmentation process. We can modify the task to bring in other elements of learning. And eventually we get to a point where we're actually redefining our learning experience because the technology provides us with an opportunity to do things that were previously inconceivable. I want to play you a short video now uh, that sort of underlines the importance of what's happening right now and what the future is for technology. Today, right now, you have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. Think about that. That's what technology really is. It's possibility, it's adaptability, it's capability. But in the end, it's only a tool. What's a hammer without a person who swings it? It's not about what technology can do, it's about what you can do with it. You're the voice, and it's the microphone. When you're the artist, it's the paintbrush. We are living in the future we always dreamed of. We have mixed reality that changes how we see the world and AI empowering us to change the world we see. You have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. So here's the question. What will you do with it? I love this video because it helps us understand this process. You know, it helps us understand the need for us to learn, potentially unlearn, and then relearn some really important pieces of the puzzle when it comes to technology. You know, and I, I used this uh, at a school recently, and, and I, I wanted to share this in the context of this school as well. And I said to them, you know, it's a school called OFS, and I said to them, in a time of this change that we're in, the ability for you to learn, unlearn, and relearn is what you have to do. You know, whether or not people support you, and they're lucky they were in an environment where the school supported them. But, you know, mistakes are okay. That learning can happen here. You know, learning can happen at your school, wherever you are. Take those risks and try new things and be willing to get to that phase where we unlearn the things we did before. We move away from this is the way we've always done things. And this is something for you to think about with your teachers, the people that push back. How can you embrace this? And what skills do you need to be able to unlearn and relearn? And where does that capacity building or professional learning come into play? Because as, as Elvin Toffler says, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Something really important as we move forward. And I want to share with you two case studies here, two companies that I've been working with recently uh, to help them understand better how educators are doing things. And I wanted to share them with you because I like this mindset. And it's something that I'm starting to see from companies globally. 
much different to when I saw them uh, when I was an EdTech director. They wanted to come in, they wanted to sell. These companies are now listening. They're actually changing and adapting their product to meet your needs. And that's particularly why I quite like working with startup companies. Because startup companies have this growth capacity where they want to learn from you. They want to change their products and they want it to fit your needs. And that's what I see as the gold standard of edtech companies moving forward. And I only wanted to share two with you. And I don't expect you to go away and sign up and use their products because that's not why I'm sharing this. I'm sharing it because of the mindset that's behind this. Clanbeat is a company out of Estonia. They're a young startup company with a little bit of funding, but very little. And they're working out of Estonia and they're working with the Estonian government to roll out these uh, the program, which is a student well-being tech program. And it's available as an app and, and on a device. And it's it really is fantastic. And I do think it's the future uh, in schools because it integrates into so many different places. And I do encourage you to check it out. And I don't expect you to check it out. But what I love about them is that they're actually a full female leadership team. And what I love about that is that these females, they're amazing leaders in the field, not only of technology, but in the field of well-being and in the field of education. And they've actually brought on teachers, educators, psychiatrists, you know, well-being professionals to help the development of this. And they're working with schools and giving them their product for free to trial and test. And they're listening. They're saying to schools, what works, what doesn't work, tell me. And then they're actually building their product to suit your needs. And I love that. And not only from the perspective as a teacher, but as a user, a parent, a student, it's phenomenal. The second product is a product out of the Maldives in Sri Lanka. And when I say Maldives, I just think amazing white sands and holiday, but they've created this tool. And at a time where you know schools are looking to VR and AR to increase engagement and, and improve results, Hologo uh, started up a few years ago and then they put it on hold. And they said, let's wait. Let's wait until schools are ready. Let's wait until technology is ready. And now they're hitting it hard. And they're going to schools and they're saying, what do you need? What do you want? And they've assigned people, the best 3D animators and artists in the world, on their team to just create content for these schools. And they're offering uh, up to a year free trial. And even for schools that want to take on case studies, and I love this model, where they say to schools, let's build case studies, but let's build them with you. Let's co-create, not only you, but your students. Let's have them involved in this process. And they're creating content. And they're saying to schools, we'll give you three, four, five years for free. We don't want to make money from you. We want to build the best program we can build. And I love that mindset. Hologo World, if you're interested in that, would be a great future-focused and innovative program to jump onto and to be a part. But more importantly, it's about building capacity in yourself. You know, and, and these are just the things that I think of off the top of my head when I think about how do I build capacity to help the team build capacity. It's about staying relevant. That's why you're here today. You're part of the Vietnam Tech Conference because you want to learn and stay relevant. You're seeking opportunities. You're here because you you were the one that seeked these out, maybe tapped on the shoulder, told to come. But you're here. You're letting people help you. You can create these opportunities. That's the next thing. How can you try new things and take risks? You know, I love Twitter. Twitter is my professional learning network of choice. That's how I connect and I engage, but it doesn't need to be an online network. You might be LinkedIn, it might be Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. You know, educators are jumping to those networks as well, but it could just be the room that you're sitting in now, the school that you're in, the people around you. That's probably the best professional learning network that you can have. The next step really is when you're building capacity is, is tell stories, create and share, get other people talking and sharing. Because at the end of the day, it starts with you. This is not going to be handed to you on a silver platter. You're never going to leave where you are until you decide where you'd rather be, as Dexter Yeager says. And I want to share with you just quickly a case study of Stanford American and where we took the school, a school of 3,200 students um, from a school where they went technology first, pedagogy second, and how we flipped that. You know, we gave our teachers innovative professional learning. We said to our leadership team, let's focus on our people. Let's give them the learning they want, that they need, that they are asking for. 
And we did that and we got time to do that. Then we did that with our students. We put our teachers in the place where they could be at the forefront of innovation. This is them using Google Expeditions, which has sadly gone away now. And, and a reason why I went to Hologo to learn a little bit more about what they're doing, because they're creating a journeys aspect um, for students that matches uh, the Google Expeditions experience as well. We taught our kids, we let them innovate, we got them to ask questions, and we taught our teachers that it's okay to use this as a small portion of their learning and lesson. We aligned with companies. We aligned with this company called Lightnear. And Lightnear were a company that, that I loved that helped them actually make and create and allowed them to make and create uh, an app, a program that came from the developers of um, Angry Birds. And they helped develop and create this product, gave them feedback and went from there. And it was an exciting process to be a part of. You know, and we took this journey. We moved our teachers from the skill set of, you know, let's just teach our kids skills in elementary only. We actually changed that model and we weren't loved for this, but it was something we had to do in that process. And we had to change that. We're not going to come in and teach your class anymore so you can go off and have a coffee. We're going to teach you and we're going to focus on upskilling you because we want you to transfer that knowledge to your students. Then we created this K-12 vision to possess a culture where everyone thrives in a constantly evolving landscape. We focused on creation over consumption and we developed this model. A model where it's not just providing curriculum support, we provided human resources to co-teach, to train, and then we developed skill sets and we built this out. We empowered our school community and we enhanced that student learning experience as a result. We invested in our people and we said, we're not going to buy any more tools, no more devices, no more subscriptions. Let's invest in people. And we built a team of five. And that model came to life and we used the ISTE standards to help us, you know, as a tool that's evidence-based, data-driven, authentic and purposeful and aligned. And we mapped it out over a three-year period where we could explicitly teach our teachers how to use these skills as part of what they do, not as an added extra, but how do we integrate these into the day-to-day -day operations of our school. And we empowered our teachers but we set up non-negotiables as well. We said to our teachers, you need to be a common sense certified educator and we'll help you get there. We gave them time and the learning that they needed to become a certified educator. And because we were a one-to-one -one Apple school, we said we need teachers to be at a place where we have a minimum expectation. You know, Our teachers need to know how to use the devices. So we'll train you to become an Apple teacher because at the end of the day, at the heart of what we needed to do, we needed to empower our teachers so that they could empower their students. You know, and as I come to the end of this keynote, I wanted to share this. This is a, a podcast that I produce every week, every Friday. It's called the Ignite EdTech Podcast. Uh, it's free. You know, go away and listen to it. It's something that uh, I talk with experts from all over the world, international educators, people in the space of edtech. I share a tool and I share some strategies every week. No more than 30 minutes. It's free. It's on the podcast channel of your choosing. You can jump on it and have a look. You know, as I sum up today and I take you on the journey that's going to be VTC, I encourage you to think about this. As educators, we're the last generation to understand life before the internet. The last generation to understand life before a smartphone. The last generation to understand how to connect without using social media. To be fluent translators of what it was like before and now after technology. And I'm guilty of this, but to wonder each morning what should I do instead of picking up your phone and wondering what you missed by looking up your notifications. Plan with your future in mind. Know your why and stay up to date because the reality is if you don't do these things, you will be left behind. You've got people around you to help you. You've got leaders in your buildings that will support you. You've got companies that are there when you need them. Think through this process and more importantly, stay in touch. If you need help, don't hesitate to ask me. You know, I've got a team of people all over the world that are here to help people learn and grow. We've just launched uh, last week our learning portal as well, learning.igniteedtech.com. 
courses for people in your school to help them grow, develop, and change. And if you want to be a part of that, jump on board. We're here to help you. Thank you so much for your time today. Enjoy the VTC conference. If you've got questions, join me for the Q&A session immediately following this, and I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. Jump on the Hoover app, find what you want to do, write down that why and find the experiences that are going to help you get what you need out of today. Thank you so much. Enjoy the conference and I'll see you again really soon. Take care. Bye-bye.